Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming out. Uh, my name is Tim Abbey. I'm the commercial hort educator here in York County. Uh, so that means I work with anyone who grows anything for sale here in the county, ag-wise. But uh, my main position for extension is I cover a number of counties around Harrisburg for the green industry, which is the ornamental plant industry, helping them diagnose plant problems, and I do programming for them, mostly for their pesticide applicators license. So uh, one of my um, supervisors asked me to give a talk to the public about spot and lanternfly. I've been doing talks on it for the last few years though I don't really have any firsthand experience trying to manage it. The only time I've seen it was back in October 2015. Myself and some colleagues went up to Berks County to, to check it out. It is not in York County as far as being identified here. I mean, it's possible it could be here and just hasn't been found yet. So we're gonna kind of just go through a little bit of the uh, biology, why it's um, of concern in Pennsylvania and some other states and then um, just kind of open it up for anybody who has some questions. So this is an adult, um, pass this over to you. So it is not actually a fly, it's um, actually one of the true bugs. So um, it's not related to like horse flies and house flies, it's not a butterfly. Um, if you see any, this is just a, weird entomological quirk that if you see something where the name says lanternfly or dragonfly or mayflies and the words are run together, it's really not a true fly. It's a different type of insect. Why that came about, I have no idea. All right, so why do we care here in Pennsylvania? Um, Pennsylvania uh, has a lot of ag industries that could be impacted by um, spotted lanternfly. We are the number one exporter of hardwood, trees, or lumber in the country and then rank fairly high in a number of other um, things like apples and grapes. One of the things I think is really unique about Pennsylvania, I can't remember where we are um, in the state rankings as far as overall land mass. We're somewhere I think in like the low 20s or 30th or something, but we have a third amount of acreage set aside for state parks, only behind Alaska and California. So there's a lot of potential impact. For me, there's also the impact because this really doesn't take into a, um, account park trees, um, homeowner trees, street trees, because you can have a problem with spot and lantern fly on those too. So these are the various businesses that are impacted by the quarantine. I'll talk about that a little bit more soon. So it's really Pretty much everything is impacted by spot and lantern fly as far as a quarantine goes. All the different businesses who basically move things in and out of a quarantine county are going to be impacted. So again, York County doesn't have it. That really doesn't apply here. Uh, other than if there are businesses who do a lot of work over in the eastern part of the state, they really should go through the, the Department of Ag training to um, get their permits, which are little tags they can put under vehicles to move in and out so that they've been trained to look for it so they're not moving it. So it's actually a type of plant hopper. So you may have seen different plant hoppers or um, leaf hoppers, tree hoppers. And they have piercing and sucking mouth parts. So they do not chew plant material. They land on thin bark trees or shrubs insert their mouth parts, and then basically they're sucking out sugar, feeding in the phloem, taking out carbohydrates. We don't have any insects in Pennsylvania that look like it. There are some moths that if you take a stretch, they might kind of look like an adult, but we have nothing that really looks like them. We do get calls here at the extension office. People think they've found them, particularly this year, and they have something else. Some woman called earlier that I spoke to, probably about a month ago, who told me that she thought she had one and it tried to bite her. And I'm like, they don't bite, so. And the adults weren't out at that time anyway, so it was nothing really to worry about. So what you see here, um, these are sticky bands that they have used in the quarantine area at first to try to trap down the population. Now it's more for monitoring. And the immature stages, which don't fly, will get stuck on those and they can go and detect them. And then here, this is a female over there to the right who has, is in the process of laying eggs and she covers them with this, 
material sort of looks like putty, I guess is the closest thing I can relate it to. And that provides protection for the winter. They overwinter in an egg stage. This is just showing you the underside. It's a little hard to make out um, just because it's black on black, but, but these are the mouth parts right there. So they have fairly long mouth parts, just like being bitten by a mosquito. It's the same sort of operation. The males are a little bit smaller than the female, and that's in a lot of cases for a lot of insects. So these masses here, on this birch tree. All of these here, this, that's the overwintering stage. And depending on where the female decides to lay her eggs, she could, you know, obviously pick a tree, but it could be a rock. It could be a wooden container that somebody's going to move out of that area. When I was up um, in Berks County a few years ago, there were egg masses on old, um, plastic containers you buy nursery plants in, because the guy's yard that we were in was kind of junky and had his stuff piled up. There were some on a garbage can. So really a female is pretty indiscriminate where she's going to lay her eggs. So this is the overwintering stage. So usually by, I would say, mid-October to late October, they're wrapping up egg laying, and then this is the stage it'll go through until they start to hatch in May. So it was first discovered in Pennsylvania in 2014, and that was also the first North American detection of this particular insect. It's native to parts of Asia, Vietnam, parts of China. Um, it was recently introduced into South Korea uh, a number of years before it was found here in Pennsylvania, and they've actually had some significant economic impact, particularly to their grape production. And it's been found on at least 60 species of woody plants, but I've also heard recently that it possibly could be 70. Uh, all the information that I've had, either what I saw firsthand, or other extension educators, or arborists who work over in the sort of southeast of the state, it's all been on trees and shrubs. I have not heard anything about it feeding on perennial plants, like whether those would be flowering garden perennials, or annuals, and that would include like vegetable crops, like tomatoes and peppers. I can't definitively say it won't feed on those, but I have not heard anything of it feeding on those type of plants. But as I already mentioned, it's a, it's a big concern for the tree fruit, vineyards, uh, logging, and even for me, for the ornamental plants. So there's no way to read the text on this, but this is just kind of showing the life cycle. So over winter is in that egg stage. Uh, the immatures of this insect are called nymphs. The first three nymphal instars, or um, I'm trying to think of another word for instar, it's like stages of being an Im immature, are, bla are black and white, and then the last one you're going to get the red, black, and white. So they have very striking colors as immatures. They're excellent hoppers, they, the immatures don't fly, and then you start getting adults out in July. I think um, colleague told me that the first adult that they had seen was about the middle of July over in the quarantine areas. So by now they should all be adults, though there could be some stragglers that are still immatures. And the adults can fly, um, and I think I have a video that will show you this, that um, still not quite known how far they'll disperse, if they'll go miles to find a host plant, like uh, something like emerald ash borer, which is another non-native insect pest. And they only have one generation per year. So in, in the grand scheme of things, I guess that's a good thing. You're not dealing with something that goes through two or three, which can quickly build up numbers. But just the one generation per year, you can have quite a few. All right, so one of the primary hosts is Tree of Heaven. I'm sh I know I'm pretty sure down at the park you have Tree of Heaven. I know you have all kinds of other invasives down there. Um, just to show you a side-by-side, -side, you don't have to handle the tree of heaven because it stinks. There's sumac, and then there's tree of heaven. If you've never smelled tree of heaven, crush a leaf and smell it. It's, it's horrible. So that is a favorite. So tree of heaven is not a native tree species. It's considered an invasive plant uh, in North America. 
And if it just stayed on that, nobody would really care, but it does have all these other hosts it'll go to. So Tree of Heaven is being used as um, a monitoring plant. The immatures particularly like to go to it, but also the adults. And when I'm out and about in the counties I cover, when I find, if, I, if it's a place where I can look at Tree of Heaven, I check it just to see if I can find any on there. And then I'll also talk about this trap tree um, project that's been set up through the Department of Agriculture, and they're using Tree of Heaven as the trap tree. So these are the, that last instar immature stage. Again, nothing we have looks like this. Very striking colors. And if you would approach these, these are going to start jumping all over to get away. So the red dots are detections. So once, when I first started with this, uh, with meaning the Department of Ag, with the quarantine, they, would, they were doing it by township. Um, but then as it started to spread, particularly last year, now if, if we find it in one location in York County, they'll quarantine the entire county. So this little video, even though the insects are out of focus, are the, um, oops. So these are the adults flying around last year in an orchard. You kind of see them going. So they're pretty active. It's, you know, they'll, they'll move a lot farther than I think was originally thought. So when I was up uh, there, so this was shot like la late last July or August. When I was up there, the adults really weren't flying around a lot. It was October. Um, they were they'd made it, the females were laying eggs, the males were just kind of hanging around, no, nothing was flying. So when you put a quarantine in effect, and it depends on the state who controls that, um, you can have a state quarantine, that's going to be you, or um, like here, Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture, when it becomes a federal quarantine, which this is also, that you also have the United States Department of Agriculture gets involved. So you're trying to limit distribution but at least initially, you're also trying to eradicate the problem. And in our area here, uh, we've had one of the success stories of eradication a number of years ago, and that was with plum pox virus over in Adams County. That was a new viral pathogen in North America, and it took a number of years, but through eradication and destroying trees, they were able to get rid of that pathogen. So as far as I know, PDA is still trying to do eradication of this pest. So these were the five initial um, townships in eastern Berks County back in November 2014 when they put the quarant or December 2014 when they put the first quarantine in place and this is what we have now um, the circle showing where the original detection was I have heard recently that um, spot and lantern fly was found like around Lancaster City and then also somewhere down in here um, there's a park uh, on the Lancaster side of the Susquehanna that they were seen over there too. Now, this is secondhand information. I have not seen that myself, but that's the latest that I've heard. And I was going to drop in another map, and I forgot to do it, but um, spotted lanternfly in the last uh, calendar year has also been found in Virginia, down in Winchester, Virginia, which is right down 81, which passes up through the quarantine area. So to take a, not even a wild guess, that somebody accidentally moved something out of the quarantine area and took it down to Virginia. I've not heard that confirmed, but that's what I would think had happened. And then the other thing, just in the last, I think, two weeks, it's been found in New Jersey. So not just an interception of an adult, but an established population. So all stages are under the quarantine. Um, the immatures and the adults are pretty easy to see, but those egg masses, because of their coloration and where the female will lay eggs, that's a good way to accidentally move um, the populations around would be on just things you'd not expect to find in egg mass. And then these are the various things that have to be inspected to leave the quarantine area. So for businesses, um, you know, anybody who's harvesting apples or other things and putting them into wooden containers for shipping, um, it's going to be, they're going to get, I think, into a rhythm of looking for this particular pest. 
For the general public, I think it's still going to be more of a challenge. Uh, you know, if they're moving out of an area, uh, the moving companies are supposed to have gone through the training, so they're supposed to also look, but you never know how vigilant somebody's going to be. So I, th I think the chance of accidentally moving this are still fairly great. But it's really pretty much anything you can think of that's outside is going to be quarantined. So the challenges are raising public awareness. Um, that's what this meeting was for today. Um, but even areas that have been inundated with this for a number of years, like Berks County, um, we get calls here to our office from people in Berks County who, from talking to a few of them, and they're handled by some other people in the office, it doesn't sound like they're even aware of this, which is to me just shocking. They've been dealing it with now for almost four years. There's been a lot of... Uh, public relations uh, events up there about it, both through Extension and the Department of Ag. And I'm, they must have been living under a rock not to have heard about this because I just can't believe that. The other thing is firewood sales. That's how a lot of, uh, particularly boars, um, get moved around like emerald ash borer where the larvae are feeding inside of the wood and you cut firewood and you move it somewhere else and then the larvae pupate and hatch and come out as adults and you moved it that way. I think that's another way this is going to get moved around. And then also yard waste disposal. So this photo here is from one of the very early detection sites back in 2014. So here's just an old, looks like a railroad tie. And there's one, two, three, four, at least six egg masses on there. So again, with somebody not being familiar with this and they want to get rid of their junk, they just have somebody come pick it up and move it somewhere else. This form is in the back. Uh, this was put together in the last, I don't know, six, seven, eight months. Um, it's the uh, extension form that's been put together to kind of talk about how to deal with these as far as a management plan, like when the different life stages are out and what the control options are. And I'll talk about control towards the end. So I said, th this is one of the favorite hosts. So this is Tree of Heaven. Uh, if there's anybody watching online, if Tree of Heaven does look like our um, staghorn sumac, our native sumac, uh, sort of looks like, I guess, if you stretch it out, maybe a hickory or something else. But with Tree of Heaven, they have white papery seeds that are hanging down now. It's a clonal plant, meaning there's usually a mother tree, and then you have root suckers that come up, but it does also um, propagate off of seeds. The foliage is really, it's very strong, nasty smell to it. To me, it smells like burnt peanut butter, but it's Pick some worse smell you can think of, and that's what it can be for you. It has uh, smooth edges to the leaf. The leaflets for sumac have serrations or little teeth all the way along the leaf. And with uh, Tree of Heaven, if it has any, it sort of has like a little thumb projection down at the very bottom end of that leaflet. Um, not much else feeds on Tree of Heaven. I mean, I occasionally see some holes chewed in leaves, but I don't think anything really likes to feed on it. It's a fairly um, toxic plant. Some people do have reactions to the uh, sap if they're cutting it or using a weed whacker to take it down and get some on their skin. But it usually grows like this, clumps, but it can get to be very tall too. And it's very common if you drive down any of the highways in Pennsylvania or Route 30 that, cut, 30 that cuts through York County, you can see it growing all along the roadway. Those are the seeds that are um, hanging down now. With sumac, that has uh, kind of the reddish cone, upside down ice cream cone seeds that grow just from the top. They don't hang down and they're not white. And there's sumac. But oftentimes you can find these growing close to each other. The ones that I got this morning, the samples I have here, they weren't too far from each other. All right, so the trap tree strategy, this was put in place last year. They're still doing this. Is so you find these areas uh, that have a really good population of tree of heaven. And then go through, take out 90% of the trees. And removing tree of heaven is, uh, um, if you don't do it correctly, you're going to end up with more tree of heaven. Um, if you cut the tree trunk or trees down, it's going to uh, cause the tree to put out a lot of root suckers, and then you're going to be managing those. The um, best thing to do is kind of late season, kind of cut through the bark of the tree into the cambium, which is the layer of tubes that run up and down in the tree, 
and apply something like glyphosate, which is most people know as Roundup, or triclopyr, which is like Brush Be Gone, and some other non-selective herbicides. So that gets taken down into the roots, but doesn't trigger the tree to put up the root suckers. But the goal here is you're dropping that population of tree of heaven down, and then you treat the 10% of trees that you leave with, I think they've been using imidacloprid, which is a systemic insecticide. It's available to homeowners and it's, it's bare tree and shrub. It also has a lot of commercial applicator products. And they may also be using uh, dinotefuran, which is another systemic insecticide. I don't think there's a homeowner formulation of that. I could be wrong. The commercial product is Safari. So they treat those trees. Then since they've lo lost their favorite host plant, they go over to those treated trees and they feed on that, sucking in the uh, insecticide, and then that kills them off. So I've seen pictures of this with just mounds of dead spotted lantern flies at the base of the tree. So it does work. But it is time consuming. Um, and again, if you don't manage Tree of Heaven correctly, you'll end up more, with more of a problem. So just in the last calendar year, there's been a lot of money thrown at this. Uh, would have been nice to have had it happen a few years ago, but hopefully we'll still be able to get ahead of the problem and take it out. So uh, the federal government's put a 17 and a half million. The state has put in at least 1.6 million. I think it's more than that since I made this slide. But there's just so much that's not known about this insect. Um, very little out of South Korea, which it was actually not a native insect there and it was a problem. So they were just starting to do research on it. So all of these different things are looking, being looked at. Uh, what is the, when, did, when do you start to experience economic damage of grapes or some other um, fruit tree? Like how many, what's a threshold? You can tolerate 10 per vine before you start to have an issue as far as maybe a decrease in yield. Um, the other problem with grape production is when they harvest, the adults are still out and they can accidentally collect adults. And then when they're pressing the grapes, they're going to press the insects and the wine's going to end up tasting terrible because those insects have the alkaloids from Tree of Heaven in them. But looking at lures, these would be pheromones that insects give off to attract other insects that are aggregation pheromones, which means they try to find something and then attract others over to it, like a feeding site or an overwintering site. You have the sex pheromone that females give off to attract males. And so they're trying to find out if they can work out um, pheromones, probably more so for monitoring than for eradication, but they may try it for eradication too. Just trying to be able to rear these things full time in a lab, they got to figure out how to feed them. So they're looking at things like that. And then trying to see if there are any predators or parasitoids. And those would be insects that parasitize other insects. Do we have any here that will go after them? They have also sent entomologists over to some of the countries where they have this insect uh, as a native. And is there anything there that feeds on this and keeps it under control? Just with the bright colors and feeding on Tree of Heaven, um, my thinking is that we're probably not going to have too much that wants to feed on it because it tastes bad. But those, those bright colors are warning colors. You know, I taste bad, I sting or bite. In this case, something tastes bad. I don't think that they're going to, much is going to feed on it. And now that this is starting to pop up in different states, they're doing DNA analysis to see if these were all from the original population found in Pennsylvania or are these separate uh, coincidental emergences of a different population. And even though they think it's full feed on 60 to 70 species of uh, woody plant material, they're just trying to find out, is it more than that? What's the favorite plants other than Tree of Heaven? So just show you some photos here of different stages and things. So it's hard to see, but this is an egg mass on the underside of that rock. So if you don't know what to really to look for, that, that's, nobody's going to see that and know what it is. These are egg masses that are either old when they took them or they took them, this picture in the spring and these have kind of weathered and makes it easier when those nymphs to hatch uh, for them to come out of that. The individual eggs are covered up by that coating. Uh, someone from PDA pointing at some eggs on the underside of this piece of wood. I think it's wood. I don't think it's stone. I showed you that picture already. 
There's another egg mass pointing on that, uh, with that stick. Uh, we have lichens that grow all over on trees and rocks and old buildings. And they sort of look like egg masses, but to me they really don't. The egg masses are smooth, almost always that gray color. Lichens can have a variety of different colors. And when you get close to a lichen, it has that sort of rippled, crinkled paper kind of appearance to it. And the spotted lanternfly egg masses do not. So one way of managing this, and this would be for like new introductions, um, sort of I think more in a very small landscape, is going out during late fall into the winter into very early spring and just scraping the egg masses off into a plastic bag and throwing them out. They're not going to survive. They're going to go to a landfill or be um, incinerated. But when you talk about, you know, like Nixon Park, which is full of large trees and big. You, you, egg, scraping egg masses is not a management tool. It's just not. It's, you can't, it can't be done. This is just kind of showing you. So there's the fresh egg mass and then the same one a number of months later. These are the actual eggs here. Right through here. So either a different female came through and laid eggs and didn't cover them, or this female just did not, was unable to produce that secretion to cover them. So they're exposed. So uh, I would assume that their winter mortality might be greater, that not too many of these survive, or um, maybe early in the spring something eats, some other insect eats them before they have a chance to hatch. So there are the immatures, the first few stages. Very noticeable, very active. And then there you have the red ones. So when these insects feed all the life stages, they produce honeydew. That's their waste product. They're, they're sucking up so much uh, fluid with sugar in it, they can't even digest it all, so they just excrete it. So that's what you see on the top. Of th this is just a close-up of this picture. But you can see the, that sticky stuff on here. So that's honeydew. A lot of other insects produce that. Aphids will produce this. Um, the group of what are called soft scales produce this. Mealy bugs, white flies. And what happens is usually you'll get a, what's called sooty mold fungus will grow on honeydew and turn whatever surface the honeydew was on will turn it black. So right now, uh, an insect that's very active now are tulip tree aphids and tulip tree scales. So if you know where there's a tulip tree and you go and look, there's probably going to be a lot of honeydew on it, and the top of the leaves are probably some level of turning like a dark color, black color. So there's an attractive little immature, the ones in that collection there, they've lost their color. I think they're probably putting alcohol first and then laid in that mount. So there's a female laying eggs. So this on the left is a, a newer uh, cluster of eggs, then one that's a little bit older, and then this uh, kind of tan colored mass, those are gypsy moth eggs. So they're going to be a different color. They're also, um, if you touch gypsy moth eggs, because they're made from the little hairs on the underside of the gypsy moth female from her body, they're kind of prickly. I mean, you can feel them. They don't feel smooth like the uh, spotted lanternfly egg masses. Okay, so this actually I need to update because we have the population in New Jersey. There's also been an interception of an adult in Delaware and in New York State. So all of our neighboring states are watching to see, you know, what happens in Pennsylvania as far as can this population be eradicated, what is being done to sort of you know, fill in all those gaps of knowledge about the insect, um, whether it's biology, host range, control options. So I think that might be the last slide, and I'll talk about control. So this is um, the contact information for the Department of Agriculture. If you think you, uh, anyone here has seen it, you can do that. And then we also have our extension hotline for spotted lanternfly that just uh, has been set up in the last month. And the number for that is 
3359. I think it comes out to be 888. The number four, bad fly, is that, you know, sort of the cute thing they did with it. But it's 888-422-3359. So as far as eradicating, if um, you have a population at some point at home or in the parks, um, there is the egg mass scraping, but again, that's going to be very small scale. Trying to manage Tree of Heaven can also have some impact, but that is, um, that's, that's work, depending on how much you have. And a lot of times with invasive plant species, you kind of have to approach managing them as, uh, or trying to eradicate them in an area as like a five-year plan. It takes a long time because a lot of those that do propagate from seed, you might be dealing with the ones that you can see, but then you're going to get regeneration of those new seeds and you've got to go out and manage those plants. In Pennsylvania, uh, the way that um, the Department of Ag views a pesticide application, in this in case would be an insecticide application, is if the product is being used in the right location for where the label states it can be used and you have similar insects on the label, you can use it for an insect that is not on the label. So in this case, spotted lanternfly is not on the label for any insecticide, as far as I know. I've never seen a label, whether that's a commercial product or a homeowner version, where it says for spotted lanternfly control. So with that ability here in Pennsylvania, there are things you can use for it. So I mentioned two systemics, that's imidacloprid and dinotefuran. So those you're trying to get into the tree, the tree takes it up, um, the imidacloprid is typically done as a soil drench, and then it moves up into the tree, and the dinotefuran is usually done as what's called a basal bark treatment, which is you spray the circumference of the bark from about shoulder high to the ground until you start to get runoff. Dinotefuran is very water soluble, and it goes right through the bark, and then will move up into the tree. You can use other what it would be considered contact insecticides to go out and spray immatures and adults. Um, most of the contact insecticides, though, are what would be considered non-selective, meaning they're going to kill like beneficial insects too. So if you had lady beetles on there, you're going to kill those also using something like carbaryl, which is a non-selective, often sold as seven. That's how most homeowners know it or one of the, what are considered synthetic pyrethroids. So they're uh, man-made, but the original compound pyrethrum comes from chrysanthemum flowers. So the synthetic pyrethroids are things like bifenthrin, permethrin. Permethrin is available for homeowners, um, but those are very non-selective, so they'll kill a lot of other insects. I think for um, Anyone who's watching, you know, the issue for you or for you in the parks would be more of the honeydew production than anything else. Um, and then just sort of the gross out factor that you've got all these bugs that hop and fly and can get onto people. They, but they don't bite. They don't bite humans or pets. They're not going to cause damage to anything else. If they get in the house, they're not going to survive. They're going to die because they have nothing to feed on. So as far as I know, they don't stain anything. Like if you smash them, I mean, some insects, if you crush them, they can stain wood. Um, so I don't think they're, if, if they, people can factor that out, they can be managed. But I think really nobody's going to want to sit underneath their picnic table or out on their back porch um, or be on a sidewalk near your visitor center when you've got massive amounts of honeydew dripping down. And I thought there was a video in my presentation of that because I know I have one where it's showing a trunk of a tree with lined with adult um, spotted lantern flies, and then you just see these droplets coming down like after a rainstorm, and that's honeydew falling out of the tree. And that's gonna really be a problem for people. So it's sort of stay tuned as far as other control options that come around. If they ever find a biocontrol agent that feeds on it, that might be an option um, in the future. If anybody thinks that they um, see it here in York County, they can call the 800 number. Um, Extension really wants us to drive everybody to that number, but I still think, you know, if you see something here, you can call the Extension office here in, um, here at Pleasant Acres. Uh, 
I could con go and confirm it. It's easy enough to confirm it, but the Department of Ag has to come down and see it since they're our regulatory body in the state. And then once they do, then they, as I said, they will add the entire York County to the quarantine. And then that really will start to impact businesses um, here in the county more so than it probably has right now. So that's all I have. If you have any questions on anything? Oh, okay. How is your invasive plant battle going down there? Uh, they're actually spraying for some things today. Oh, are they? Okay. Yeah, because you have a lot of privet and multiflora rose and Japanese stilt grass and. Yeah, it's. We're not doing it personally. Yeah, and unfortunately, down in this part of the state, they have so much stuff. Also, like the.